Well, good evening and good afternoon, wherever you might be watching us this evening or this afternoon. Thanks for joining us on this latest of the IC Talks, a program of the international community of the Society of Professional Journalists. I'm Steve Guyman, a longtime member of SPJ, president of the national organization from 1996 to 1997, and then president of the foundation for a number of years after that. I also worked at Bloomberg News for almost 21 years until I retired uh, earlier this year, uh, ending my career with three years in London, where I covered news and edited stories from around Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. So if this is the first time you're joining an IC talk, a little bit of background. The international community of SPJ is a community of journalists that encourages press freedom around the world and seeks ways to connect journalists from around the world with uh, global events and local events in a way that makes foreign affairs less foreign. The aim of this series of ICT Talks is to bring together journalists from around the world in touch with experts on topics that transcend borders. With these one-on-one -on -one conversations, we aim to dig a little deeper and create an opportunity for many to have direct access to our guests. We hope you'll learn, grow, and take away from today information that will help and inspire you in your work going forward. We're very excited once again to welcome Sanford J. Unger to our series. Regular participants will remember the excellent session with Mr. Unger when we discussed the threats to the Voice of America. The video of that session is available and maybe I can ask Dan to post the URL in the chat section so people can view that discussion later on. This time we'll be looking at press freedom rights from a global perspective and how the First Amendment of the US Constitution has inspired and still inspires journalists and press freedom advocates around the world. And this is a proper topic for today because December 15th is the 229th anniversary of the ratification of the Bill of Rights, which includes the First Amendment. And just a few days ago, we celebrated the anniversary of passage of the Universal, Universal Declaration of Human Rights that came on December 10th in 1948. In the declaration is Article 19, which guarantees freedom of expression and the right to receive and disseminate information. Sanford J. Unger, President Emeritus of Goucher College, is director of the nonpartisan Free Speech Project at Georgetown University, which is documenting the status of free expression in education, government, and civil society in America. Drawing from its online free speech tracker, it's also developing curriculum modules that can help college students develop a clearer understanding of the rule of the First Amendment in American democracy. Mr. Unger was director of the Voice of America for two years during the Clinton administration and previously was dean of the School of Communication at American University. During his journalism career, he was a staff writer for the Washington Post, Washington editor of The Atlantic, managing editor of Foreign Policy Magazine, and co-host of All Things Considered on National Public Radio. He's the author or editor of six nonfiction books, including The Papers and The Papers, an account of the legal and political battle over the Pentagon Papers. Sanford Unger earned an AB in government magna cum laude from Harvard College and a master's degree in international history from the London School of Economics. He teaches undergraduate seminars on free speech at Georgetown. And before we begin our conversation, just a bit of housekeeping. The format tonight is simple. Our guest and I will have a conversation. We'll have a Zoom chat and a Q&A features open during our talk. Please make sure that in the chat portion, you leave any technical questions or concerns. The co-chairman of the international community, Dan Kabisky, will be keeping an eye on that. And please use the Q&A button to ask Sanford Unger questions. Once we have your question, we can unmute you so you can ask the question directly. Or if you prefer that I ask the question for you, please make sure you note that and I'll be more than happy to do so. And a reminder, this talk is being recorded and will be available at our YouTube channel. Sanford Unger, can I call you Sandy? Absolutely, Steve. Okay, I know from uh, late the uh, recent discussions about uh, uh, credentials, academic credentials, formal titles and whatnot, uh, you know, but in a conversation, I'm Steve, you're Sandy, so. You can call me kiddo if you want to. <laughs> It may come up later in the discussion. In any event, thanks for, so much for spending some time with us tonight. And as I noted, today is the anniversary of the uh, passage of the Bill of Rights. Actually, it's the ratification, I think. Ratification, of, that's right. right. 
229 years, how is it doing so many years later? Is it still as effective? Is it still as potent? Uh, you know, what's the health of the Bill of Rights and the First Amendment? Well, actually, an, an interesting other aspect of the anniversary is that it's just, well, actually, last year, 2019, was the anniversary of the really the first significant Supreme Court decisions under the First Amendment. First Amendment, most people don't realize, sort of sat there until really the World War I era and was not used or invoked or talked about very much. It has more recently, uh, well, 100 years worth, become very significant in Supreme Court jurisprudence and in our preoccupation. I think that uh, the First Amendment is alive and well, uh, although it's sometimes needs a little bit of uh, emergency medication. I think we've been through a very tough four years, especially for free speech in this country, where uh, the chief executive of the United States has been very supportive of speech that he agrees with, but very critical and, and uh, demeaning to speech that he doesn't agree with. And that, uh, that has had some unfortunate consequences along the way. Um, I think that free speech right now has become a very uh, contested notion. And I think there are people who believe they now own free speech. They now own the, the, uh, the gate, they're the gatekeepers of free speech. And I think that uh, there's been a very interesting switch, not just in the last four years, but over a longer period of time. It seems that many conservative spokespersons believe that it's up to them to determine what free speech is and that, that it's their speech that is under threat. Uh, it used, free speech used to be thought of as a liberal idea, liberal in a sense. I mean, these terms are a disservice in many ways, but now it seems to be a conservative idea. And I don't think it should be one or the other. I think it ought to be something that is important to everybody and is a kind of neutral principle. And maybe we'll make our way, maybe we'll make our way back to that. But there are a lot of fights over free speech right now. And they go from the, the uh, significant and sublime to the absolutely trivial and ridiculous. And uh, one of the things we found in creating the free speech tracker over the last three years. We now, by the way, have almost 400 events documented or, or challenges to free speech documented on the free speech tracker. One of the things we found is, first of all, it is not true that it's only conservative speech that's challenged. Liberal progressive speech is also challenged in this era. And it's become a habit to challenge free speech. It's become something to fight about. And uh, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of arguments, not all of them constructive, not all of them leading in good directions around free speech and a tremendous tendency right now to uh, tinker in a trivial way with free speech, to, to interfere with some things that are, are just really very surprising and shocking to hear are being Wait. challenged. Sandy, where are the dangers as we have these fights over the First Amendment and over free speech? Where where should we be most concerned that those challenges play themselves out in court where we could get bad case law rather than good case law? Is there, yes. an, is there an area where we should be worried and pay close attention? Well, I think one of the problems, Steve, is that there's a sense that there are there have to be winners and losers in every free speech argument. And uh, so, uh, you know, should certain speakers be prevented from coming to college campuses or not? Should certain uh, points of view be expressed or not? And I think that the definition of free speech, to the extent that there can be one, is very much of a floating thing and needs to be how, how, how is the best way to put it? it? Needs to be worked over a little bit. People need to be a little more flexible about what they think 
is good speech or bad speech about what speech they, they want to hear. It's a very bad idea only to want to hear speech that you agree with. We, we don't, why would we need only to hear speech that we agree with? But that's, that's what's happening in a lot of cases right now. People only want to tune in, only want to hear speech that they happen to agree with and they want to shed on other speech. And there are plenty of abuses on all, all around the spectrum of this matter. I, I just want to mention a few of the, I was thinking earlier today about some of the, the trivial things that come up that I think probably would not have come up four or six or eight or 10 years ago. Um, we have, you know, regulations. I, I, I have a very broad definition of free speech, especially since I've been working on this project. I think the clothes we wear are part of our free speech. I think how we happen to present ourselves is part of our free speech, our self-expression. I mean, you and I can both remember the days when the fact of these beards that we're wearing <laughs> was regarded as a very subversive thing. I mean, it was, you were suspect if you had a beard or long hair, you were a hippie. Mm -hmm. And, and what, what was that all about? So a lot of that is coming back. I mean, you have football teams, college football teams, where alumni object to players wearing dreadlocks. And if these alumni are contributors, the coaches and the university officials think, well, maybe they better pay attention. Well, how ridiculous is that in this area that we should be regulating how people wear their hair, anybody? But that's a free speech issue to me. That's a, and then clothes, you know, this, this ridiculous nonsense um, on the other side, this idea that if somebody wears a MAGA hat, make America great again, supporting President Trump, they, do, you, do you know those hats have been banned in many, in cafeterias and coffee shops in many places because people say they, they are personally injured to see those hats. Well, it gives, it gives uh, President Trump and his supporters a, tremendous right. compliment that these hats are so important. Um, there's a football coach in Oklahoma just recently who was disciplined for wearing a t-shirt of the One American Network, this conservative network that supports Donald Trump. And are some of these trivial cases, some of, or outlandish cases or outliers, if you will, are they going into court or is this just a, a case where somebody gets slapped down because they're doing something somebody else doesn't like? For the most part, they're not going into court, although there are a few that, that may have and may still. For the most part, they're taking place in the field of higher education or in many cases in high schools. There's some totally outrageous ones in high schools. Um, they had, there's this high school in Georgia George is very much in the news these days. George has, George has been a, a real hotspot for free speech issues recently. You know, there was a, a group of students at a state university in Georgia where they, the, a speaker came, a, a Latina speaker who had just written a book and was talking about some of her views on diversity and inclusion. And a group of conservative students didn't like what she said. So they burned her books. In a, in a barbecue grill mm. after her speech. Well, that's not exactly a constructive way of dealing with ideas you, you don't like. Um, there were some students in a school last, I think it was in the summer leading toward the fall, the school was coming back into session and there was, there were, there was a student who took some cell phone videos of students in the hallways not wearing masks and not social distance. And so a number of, school, a number of students in the school came down positive tests with positive tests for COVID. So who do you think got disciplined? Not the student who didn't wear the masks or didn't social distance, but the student who took the pictures of them on cell phone video. Well, that seems to me a pretty ridiculous squelching of, of free speech. Th these things have been going on all, all over. There's a shipyard worker, can't remember exactly where it was, I think in New Jersey, 
who lost his job for wearing a Trump hat. And his foreman said that was a political statement. He couldn't wear his Trump hat on the job. Uh, isn't that ridiculous too? So, so this sort of, in the great era of free speech, we seem to be regulating speech at a very trivial, ridiculous level. And it's going to, it's going to explode and it's going to hurt a lot of people one of these days. You mentioned the MAGA hats, you mentioned the Trump campaign. Trump for the last four years has certainly waged a campaign that uh, has really tested free speech. Um, speech that he doesn't like is, right. is derided. Uh, speech that's not always accurate is, is praised and advanced. Is this the most serious assault on free speech or the ability of this country to have an, an exchange in, in the 229 years uh, since the Bill of Rights? Well, it's, of course, it's not the most important one. There are many Supreme Court cases that deal with some absolutely crucial issues of civil liberties and speech. Uh, one of my favorites is West Virginia Board of Education v. Barnett from 1943 during World War II, when Jehovah's Witnesses, not just in West Virginia, but in many states, were persecuted and prosecuted, suspended from school for refusing to pledge allegiance to the flag because in their religion, they were not allowed to pledge to any, anyone but God. And uh, I'm oversimplifying here. And in an absolute, one of the most brilliant Supreme Court decisions ever, I believe it was Chief Justice Jackson at the time who wrote the opinion in which he said, this is why we're fighting this war. This is why we're fighting World War II, to preserve the right to dissent, to preserve the right not to be patriotic in some way that someone else prescribes, but to be patriotic in your own way and to observe the rules and the, the, the values that are important to you. So there have been many very crucial things. I mean, I think of Tinker v. Des Moines, 1969 was when it was decided. It's from the mid 60s, the Des Moines School District in Iowa, where a family of Quakers sent their children to school and some other children wearing black armbands to protest the war in Vietnam. And the school suspended them, said it was disruptive of the school. And in one of the few major, major opinions written by Justice Abe Fortas during his relatively short period of time on the Supreme Court in 1969 in Tinker v. Des Moines, he said that this did not disrupt the school and this was a legitimate, and the court said, I think it was seven to two if I'm not mistaken, the court said, this is a very meaningful form of protest. And I think a lot of people believe that case endorsed symbolic protests, not you know, as distinct from disruptive or, or violent protests. So, so there have been many really crucial tests. I think, I think what's happened in the last four years that is really lamentable is that uh, a person no less than the President of the United States has come to uh, question the truth, to challenge the truth. And you know, I, I've thought a lot about this lately and wondered, does President Trump really believe he's telling the truth? You know, Kelly and Conway used to say they had their own alternative facts. Does he believe that his alternative facts are the truth? Or does he simply think that he has the First Amendment right to lie? And he might have a First Amendment right to lie. I mean, the, nowhere does it say that the First Amendment does not protect untruths, but it does a lot to damage respect among the public, and for that matter, around the world, for the truth. And and this is if you know if we're going to talk about the the role of the First Amendment in the world, I think that. You know, for many years, the United States did a lot of, for what lack of a better word, preaching, lecturing to other countries about First Amendment values, about free speech. And I actually was in favor of a lot of that lecturing. I wrote a piece some 30 years ago in which I said that uh, American foreign policy toward any country, I wrote this piece in Foreign Policy Magazine, that American policy should be based in part on whether a country has a respect 
for, in effect, First Amendment values. They don't always have a First Amendment, but free speech, free expression, freedom of the press, the right to assemble, the right to, to present one's grievances to the government, and that, that these values were something we should be proud of. Well, I wonder how easy it is these days for American diplomats, for example, to be out in the field promoting First Amendment values and America's attachment to them when you know you have had the President of the United States for his entire term calling the media and reporters, journalists, the enemies of the people. How do we how do we how do we get that? How do we take those words back and get those things straight again? How do you think that the last four years here has played out in not just in American diplomats' efforts to try to pre preach and spread free speech, but what's it done to the populist leaders in Eastern Europe, for example, the strong men in other parts of the world, in Turkey, in, in uh, the Philippines? Is this encouraging? Is it speeding a move away from free speech and, and those sorts of notions? Um, or is it just all happening uh, coincidentally? Well, those are good questions, Steve. And it's hard to draw direct lines and to know. It's hard to, hard to interview Viktor Orban, the prime minister of Hungary, and ask him whether he has suppressed, whether he has had his political party take over all the major media in his country because he was inspired by Donald Trump's attacks on, on free speech and free press. But I think that uh, there are a number of, you're right, especially in some of the relatively, you know, some of the post-Cold Cold War societies of Central and Eastern Europe, uh, there is now a, a great disrespect for free speech. I mean, in Poland, you can go to prison if you remember, or if your historical memory or you recite the historical memory of your parents about certain facts during World War II. You, you can have illegal memories in Poland. And I'm told in Hungary as well. Uh, this is very, very troubling. Now, did anybody look to Donald Trump for permission to pass those laws? I doubt it very much. But I think uh, the turn against old fashioned mediated journalism, which was telling truth as determined by reporting and investigation and research and interviews and the like, the turn against that kind of what truth used to mean has not helped journalists around the world in a place like Turkey. Turkey, I think, may have more journalists in prison than any other country in the world. China's got quite a few, Russia's got quite a few, other places do too, but Turkey, you know, um, Erdogan in Turkey was emboldened by Trump on, on many of these policies. And I mean, speaking of Turkey, the great crime that was committed in Istanbul not so long ago when the Saudis uh, killed and dismembered his body, Jamal Khashoggi, who was then a reporter for the, a columnist for the Washington Post. And, and the Trump administration did nothing, said nothing about it. This was a reporter for an American newspaper, a columnist for an American newspaper. And that and, and, suggest we thought it was okay. Yeah, well, basically, basically, uh, Trump said quite openly that the oil and aircraft deal with the Saudis, really the Saudis purchase of airplanes from us was more important than this, this issue. And, and he said very openly and very clearly that mattered more to us. Well, if just a year and a half ago or so, that mattered more to us than free speech, than our fundamental values, how long will it take for a reset? Even if Joe Biden makes a real point uh, of, of trying to return to traditional American First Amendment type values, 
you know, how, how many people are going to uh, necessarily believe what's, what, what is being reasserted now? Right. These things take a long time to reestablish, and I think that's a worry. Let me come back to that in a little bit. There's a question that we've got from Emma Roberts, who asks, what do you think of the idea that not allowing some speech can enhance free speech for others? For example, limiting the speech of those who are against the concept of free speech and would abolish it should they get in power. Could discouraging and silencing those voices help protect free speech for everyone else? Well, that is a long standing and fundamental question. Uh, you know, there were some, some uh, totalitarian leaders in Europe during the mid first third, middle of the 20th century who benefited from democratic regimes and permissive policies. I, I, uh, I mean, the rise of Hitler is a very, very complicated matter but nobody made any efforts to silence him. His book, Mein Kampf, circulated very freely. Uh, and he, of course, did not plan when he, he intended to come to power. When he came to power, he did not plan and did not put up for one second with any dissenting opinions whatsoever. The minute Hitler came to power in Germany, free speech was dead. Weimar, Germany's liberal and progressive and, and decadent policies were, were finished. Um, and, you know, you could debate for a long time if somebody had perceived this, but there were, if, if conditions had been such in Germany or in Italy with Mussolini for that matter, that somebody could have anticipated what would happen from, from this, maybe it would have been decided differently. Uh, I, you know, I think we have to worry today. How close do we come to to that margin? How close? On some occasions in this country, I think of Charlottesville from almost three and a half years ago, and. Coming to really to open public neo-fascism. And, uh, and so I, I think that my worry is with all of this is who decides, who keeps the list, who's on the committee, who says that this speech crosses the line and that speech doesn't. And does it make a difference if Donald Trump is your president, if he likes the Proud Boys, which he does, and he invites them to the White House and he he's, uh, tells them to stand by, et cetera. And then somebody else doesn't, doesn't like the Proud Boys or has different points of view. Do we have standards that shift depending on who's in power? Um, I, I think that's difficult. Uh, I know where I would personally come down on some of these things but I wouldn't want to be the sole person trusted to make those decisions. I don't think that would be right. Now, I've, I've been teaching about free speech for quite a while now, and I've had, to, I've had to think very hard about some of these things. And I used to call myself a free speech absolutist and say, anything goes always, all the time, we'll work it out in a democratic society. I have to say that my absolutism is becoming a little more subtle and a little less absolute. Because I don't think that we have a level playing field where everybody has the equal right to express his or her points of view. And so there are some people who find themselves the underdogs in our society and in a certain situation, and they under the, under the standard ground rules of, of uh, permissive free speech, they're required, it would seem at times, to listen to, let's say, Black people required to, to listen to white supremacist talk. But why should they be required to listen to white supremacist talk? I mean, we fought a civil war over that. 
we decided that white supremacy, I recognized that white supremacy survived, survived long after the Civil War. But really, do we need to hear about white supremacy? Or is white supremacy very often leading to violence, leading to clashes in the streets? Um, do, do we, now that doesn't mean, and this is very, it's very controversial for some people who are First Amendment absolutists. It doesn't mean that people have no right to express their certain opinions. I don't want us to have a list of opinions people can't express. But it does mean that perhaps universities, colleges, ought not to be required by their state laws to give an audience to some of those ideas for reasons of safety, decency, uh, defending the humanity of other people. It may mean that there has to be a little more sophistication. Time, place, and manner restrictions at times make a lot of sense as, as in order to preserve civic discourse and, and, and maintain safety for people. In some instances, the people whose voices a university or a campus or a group doesn't want to be heard generally can go to another venue and have their point of view expressed. But is that, are we really, are we headed down that sort of a path now because the speech in this country has become so divisive? Well, I hope, I hope, you know, I do, I, I, as you noted, I used to be a college president, a small liberal arts college president in Baltimore. And I never uh, banned any speakers, but I did require some people to balance their presentations at times because I feared that there were circumstances where others would be hurt and where there would be, where it was important to hear more than just one point of view. Now, if I were running a free speech project at the time, I might have written something about the college president, might have published something about the, the uh, un undemocratic attitudes of that college president, not allowing one point of view to be heard exclusively. But I felt that I was doing what was best for the community that I was in charge of managing at the time. And I wanted to protect individuals and protect the communities from violence, from, from disorder and, and, and uh, disruption. But I hope we're not headed down that way. I hope we don't have, I, I mean, obviously the ideal is for all voices, all points of view to be able to be heard in the community. But, but Emma Roberts' question does raise this, this idea, this notion, there might be some points of view that are dangerous lead to violence and cut off other points of view. So I think she's on to something. I, I, I may not think it's easy or simple to, and, and again, I don't know who would decide which points of view, but I think we have to keep an open mind that we better be careful we don't undermine our own freedoms with those freedoms at some point. Let's go back to the, uh, the globalization of the Bill of Rights, looking at uh, where free speech stands around the world. It's alive and well, you say, here in the States, occasionally needs some uh, attention. We're in a period right now where it needs attention. Overseas, has the, 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 the free speech rights of citizens around the world really been encroached at a greater rate? Um, are they more in jeopardy? around the world than they are here? Well, I would say there are some places where they are profoundly in jeopardy and especially in, in developing countries. I mean, you had a, 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 a sort of brief golden moment. I'm not sure golden is the right word for it, but there was a time after the Cold War, after the defeat of communism in Russia and before Vladimir Putin came to power, under Boris Yeltsin in a period where there was much more free speech, free press, free expression in Russia, post-Soviet Russia. There no longer is, we, we, we know that. Um, 
And it was a, a taste of freedom, I think, for the Russians that just somehow couldn't possibly last. It, it was uh, under the, the leadership that eventually came to power. So there were moments when there was a lot of freedom there. Uh, there are places in the developing world where there have been experiments with, with free speech and uh, experiments with a free press and open an open society, which have soon disappeared because the, I mean, I'm thinking about, I'm just, my mind is wandering to Nicaragua. Nicaragua, Samo, you remember when Samosa was overthrown, I believe in the 1970s, and the uh, uh, Sandinistas came to power and they were promoting free speech and free thought. And there was a great flowering of the arts. And now, today in Nicaragua, one of the original Sandinistas, Daniel Ortega, is a worse dictator mm -hmm. than the people they overthrew 30 years or more ago. And, oh, it's more, many more than 30 right. years ago, I guess. Um, so those young idealists have become brutal dictators, totalitarian rulers, a place Eritrea, which fought for its independence from Ethiopia in the Horn of Africa. When I was director of the Voice of America, which is quite a while ago, 20 years ago now, the new young progressive leader of Eritrea, who had just fought a war of independence from Ethiopia, came to visit me at the Voice of America. This was not an uncommon thing to happen. It was you know, I haven't ever been visited by heads of state from very many countries ever in my life, nor would I expect to be. But this guy, uh, I have Isaias, I, I can't remember if it's his first name or his last name, but he came to see me, really a nice guy. I mean, you would have, you would have let him sell you anything. You would have believed that he was one of the great liberal Democrats, progressive people, of the world. He is still in power some 20 years after he came to see me. He has had some journalists in prison for almost that entire time. He's one of the most brutal dictators in the world. So there are moments when we allow ourselves to believe that free speech, free press, the freedoms we hold dear are are advancing, are coming into effect in, in certain countries. And before you know it, you look away, you look back some years later and the same, same guy, it's usually a guy, is in power and he's repressing people. And he has persuaded himself, like the Soviets in their time, that keeping himself in power is in the best interests of his people. I think Donald Trump thinks that. He obviously is willing to try anything to keep himself in power. And that's very, very frightening to see that happening in this country. And it has a lot to do with free speech. I mean, what is a more basic form of speech than voting? And he has gone into courts and asked that the votes of people be, be uh, canceled. He's, his behavior, his actions, his uh, campaign to stay in office really probably gives some support to uh, leaders in other countries oh. where they try to negate the votes. And that's something that's going to be hard to stop, don't you think? That's right. No question about it, Steve. You're absolutely right. I think that there are, uh, there are despots and dictators around the world who will read from the texts of Donald Trump in the years to come. And so it's, it, uh, I, I think, uh, it, so it's done damage to us, but it's also done a lot of damage to our reputation around the world. You know, we, we, it, it's hard. I mean, it, it's actually, yes, we can claim we, we push this aside. Uh, people from both parties counted all the legal votes, were not intimidated. I mean, some of, there's some, remarkable stories of courage. And I hope these people will be recognized 
for standing up to the president of the United States and standing up to the people who want to do in democracy. So in some ways there's a good, well, the story's not, we don't have an end to the story yet, but there's a good chapter to the story that we can tell in, in the coming months and years. But meanwhile, there've been some pretty bad chapters and some pretty bad examples in this home of the free and land of the brave where free speech was not in such good shape. And by the way, the Free Speech Project has enough business to keep it going for years. Uh, it would be great to be able to go out of business and say the problem's been solved, but there's a lot more work to do. I was gonna say organizations like yours usually set up to, to be out of business when the, when the problem has been solved, but in this case, it continues. Um, I just want to remind our, our uh, participants this evening that if you have a question, please use the Q&A button to ask uh, Sandy Younger any questions. Once, you once we have your question, we'll unmute you so you can ask it directly or I can ask the question for you. Uh, Sandy, it's been almost four years that uh, Trump has been in the White House. We know what's happened in those four years. It's often said that damage done, actions taken, policies reversed in four years, don't take four years to be unreversed. It can take a lot longer. How much, how, how long is it likely that the Biden administration and its successors spend trying to undo damage done for things like free speech in this country, the attacks on the press, the signals that's, that have been sent to other, other governments? Well, of course, it's very hard to say, Steve. And uh, there hasn't been anybody in a long time that's been flawless on these matters. Uh, it's worth remembering from time to time that there is one administration in the history of the United States that prosecuted more government officials and members of the media for leaks of national security information to the press than all others combined. That was not the Nixon administration. So they did some of it. It was the Obama administration. Barack Obama is somebody I admire very much in many respects, but he and his attorney general, Eric Holder, brought more cases under the Espionage Act, the old Espionage Act from World War I times, brought more cases than all other administrations combined because they, prom they had promised an open government free information, and then they didn't like the inconvenience of a lot of the leaks from people who took that seriously. So uh, we don't know uh, whether some of the people who worked in the Obama administration with Joe Biden still feel that way. We, we, we have no idea. It, there's an opportunity for the incoming Biden administration, all these people being named to it to show how much they believe in free speech, how much they believe in the right of the people peaceably to assemble, as the First Amendment says, uh, which can include people who are opposing lockdown orders, who felt they were assembling to preserve their individual rights. There's a drama that will continue to play out at the Supreme Court where uh, many people believe that the religion clause of the First Amendment is more important than some of these other clauses. So the uh, so-called establishment clause. So it's a, you know, for example, the Supreme Court already issued the, the new Supreme Court with its clear conservative majority, issued an order saying that religious assembly could not be restricted by people for public health purposes. Mm -hmm. And that affected the Hasidic Jews in New York, it affected Baptists in other places, and uh, evangelicals in various states. It's, it's an ecumenical ruling in, in many respects. And it's, I think the court would say it's a First Amendment ruling. It's preserving freedom of religion, but it's, granting a hierarchy of rights that not everybody will necessarily 
agree with. And, uh, you know, and there was uh, the, the famous masterpiece cake shop case in Colorado of uh, just a couple of years ago, where a bake shop was found to be within its rights of a bakery in deny, refusing to do a wedding cake for a single sex, same sex couple. Huge, huge case that everybody knew about. Well, the decision was made in part, it was in, in a way the Supreme Court punted on the case, but the decision was made in part that the Colorado Human Rights Commission did not have adequate respect for the religious scruples of the bakery owner. And that was actually how the case was, it, maybe it was not decided, but to the extent it was decided, it was on those grounds. So yes, we're talking about the human public accommodation rights. Is a bakery a public accommodation? Another case that's before the Supreme Court now raised the question whether a flower shop is a public accommodation. I believe in Philadelphia, um, do, does a flower shop have to provide a floral display for a same-sex wedding. Well, you could argue that the rights of association, the rights of speech and, and uh, expression of the same-sex couple are at stake, but you could also argue that the religious rights of the florist are at stake. And these are not gonna be easily, easy things to decide. And, and I think, uh, you know, the other thing is that a lot of the First Amendment cases, a lot of the recent free speech cases from the Supreme Court have been protecting the speech of commercial entities from regulation. They are still free speech cases. They may not be free speech cases that liberal advocates necessarily appreciate or want to defend, but they are also free speech cases. That's free speech cannot and should not belong to one side of the political spectrum or the other. It just, it just won't work. As Biden comes into office on the 20th of January, I know he's got a humongous, as the Brits would say, a big inbox, <laughs> uh, overflowing inbox. Um, is there something, is there a priority that should be placed on restoring the American values of free speech, free press and assembly in overseas areas? Is there something tangible that Biden can do through the emissaries and embassies, through his appointments of ambassadors, you know, what would you like to see in a in a in a um, aggressive sort of way for this new administration to do come January twentieth, on re with regards to free speech? Well, first of all, of course, I would. Uh, he hasn't asked me, but I would like to see the new president have a profound respect for free speech, even when it's inconvenient. You know, Trump issued an executive order protecting free speech at colleges and universities, he said. But it was really to protect speech that he favored. Mm -hmm. And he was going to cut off all federal funding to any colleges, universities that did not allow the people he wanted to speak to be able to speak. Uh, it, there's not been one case where those sanctions have been, have been put into place in, under that executive order thus far, although he's still got a little over a month to go and could still do some outrageous things. But I would like to see President Biden and Vice President Harris make it very clear that they honor the American tradition of free speech and that there's no good speech and bad speech. There are some forms of speech that may be hate speech and have to be handled in a a somewhat different manner, and I'm not, I, I wouldn't advocate that he require people to listen to speech that denies their humanity, but that, you know, it's just, I, I, I would hope, I would hope fervently that the new administration would not put up with nonsense like banning hats for their political opponents in the school cafeteria or something like that. And I hope that if he ever gets a chance to name justices to the Supreme Court, that he would name people who would not apply some of these laws and rules in a partisan way. I, I don't know 
How many people have seen a, a speech, an extraordinary video of a speech that Justice Alito, sitting justice, gave to the Federalist Society recently? I recommend that people watch it. It's available on YouTube. But it is an extraordinary thing. It is one of the most political, partisan speeches that I've ever imagined a Supreme Court justice could give. And it is, it is something we really have to worry about. This is not a Trump appointee to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. This is somebody who's been there for quite some time now. So I would hope that the people that a Biden administration would name to the Supreme Court to lower federal courts, that's especially important. Appeals courts, district courts, federal courts, as vacancies open, that, that they would name people who respect these enduring values and let the chips fall where they may. Um, you know, that's another thing. President Obama, because of difficulties in Congress and he had other priorities, he left a lot of vacancies on the federal courts when he left office. And we know who filled them. In four mm -hmm. years, in four years, Donald Trump filled many more federal court slots than President Obama did in eight years. So I would just hope, and what can they do overseas? I think we have to get our house in order at home first. I think we have to make it clear to the world that free speech is alive and well in this country, that if a football player wants to uh, take a knee rather than standing or saluting the flag during the national anthem, that his right to do that is respected just as women's soccer team members can do that, that the right to express opinions is, is respected. That doesn't mean that everybody has to follow that, but we've got to, you know, I mean, you had a president of the United States suggesting that football players should be fired because of, because of things like this. We've got to demonstrate that what we're doing at home is in keeping with the First Amendment before we start lecturing to others again. I, I understand your point about getting the house in order since so much has happened in the last four years that needs to be addressed urgently and immediately. Would it make sense for Biden as sort of an, an acknowledgement that we have a greater role to play on the world stage to single out a country, to single out a leader and threaten sanctions or take other sorts of, of action against Orban or Erdogan or Modi or one of the, one of the, the leaders where freedoms are being eroded. Is there, in your mind, is there one nation that's the poster boy for, you know, action that would send a signal that might make other nations take notice? Well, I think one thing a president of the United States and a new administration could do is appeal <clears throat> that all the journalists in the world who are imprisoned, and some of them under death sentences, should be released from prison. That would be that would be a good way to start. Um, uh, you know, not can't necessarily make it happen. We, we don't, and a lot of people would call it cultural imperialism to tell other other places what to do. But I think to stand up for persecuted journalists, to stand up for speakers and political forces that have been repressed, to advocate for some of these ideals would be perfectly in order. And to advocate for that with countries who are allies, as well as countries who are adversaries. Um, the imprisonment of journalists is no more evil in China than it is in Turkey or in Saudi Arabia, countries that we happen to get along with for one reason or another right now, maybe we won't for that long. But there are, there are cases. I mean, uh, South Korea is a country where there used to be tremendous abuses of human rights and the United States overlooked them. And South Korea is a very democratic country now that, that votes people out of office who abuse the public trust. And I believe that the position of journalists in South Korea is a whole lot better now than it used to be some years ago. So that brings up the question of North Korea, whether, whether the new administration 
is going to take on one of the most repressive. I mean, it's a sort of comic opera form of repression, but there's nothing funny about it, what the people of North Korea suffer. And uh, one has to, I think we can count on the fact that President Biden will not have the bromance with Kim Jong-un that President Trump seemed to have. Uh, uh, Kim is one of the few world leaders who has yet to acknowledge, at least as of this morning, was one of the few who had not yet acknowledged that, uh, that, that Biden had been uh, elected. Um, so you feel fairly confident that the, uh, the First Amendment, the Bill of Rights, is in good shape, stressed from time to time, not broken, bent perhaps, but not broken. Well, not broken, violated, often with impunity, some areas of our society, high schools. I mean, high school principals and school boards are among the worst enemies of the First Amendment in this country. The way they censor student newspapers, student expression, and, uh, and you know, get a, there are organizations that uh, try to stand up and, and fight this. The Student Press Law Center is one. Um, so there are, there are continual attacks on the First Amendment, First Amendment values. But I think that um, we've withstood some of the hardest times the First Amendment has had in years. Of course, the First Amendment had some trouble in the Nixon administration as well. And we, we survived that. And it will be, it will be uh, challenged again. But yes, I think it, I, I think it's, it's coming back, I hope. Uh, we know you've already answered this question previously, but in light of today's discussion, we wanna ask you again, Sandy, what does press freedom mean to you? I think press freedom means that people who are working as journalists, who are the conduits providing information to a society ought to be able to work freely fairly, openly, <clears throat> without having to worry whether the door will be knocked on at night and they'll be arrested, without having to worry whether they'll be fired, lose their job for expressing the truth. Um, you know, this term fake news has done us a lot of damage. The fake, the purveyors of fake news are, are completely on the other side and uh, they're losing their champion in the White House. Uh, I think that there's a reckoning to be had in American journalism. <clears throat> Even President Trump's supporters don't seem to like Fox News anymore. If I were running Fox News, I'd be looking hard at what the future of the network is. I think a lot of Trump's bluster, a lot of this is going to uh, to fade over the next months as people are reminded, are reminded what a democracy is really like. And I think that we, we will, that kind of press freedom is what I have in mind. Sandy, thank you very much. Thanks for taking time to discuss these issues with us this afternoon. On behalf of the international community, I wanna thank Sanford Unger for joining us for a very stimulating and wide ranging discussion. And thank you for joining us. This is the last IC talk of 2020. Many more are planned for 2021, including to start, the SPJ International Community will look at the threats to press freedom in Hong Kong. The first guest is Eric Wishart of Agence France Press in Hong Kong, who's also first vice president of the FCC, the Foreign Correspondents Club based in Hong Kong. He's also co-convener of the Press Freedom Committee. The session will be held Tuesday, January 12th at a time to be determined. If you are already not signed up to receive the community's weekly newsletter with program updates, please drop us a line at spj.internationalcommunity at gmail.com. That's spj.internationalcommunity at gmail.com. On behalf of the SPJ International Community, Sanford Unger, I'm Steve Guyman. Good night from Washington. Thank you, Steve.